like to invite you to turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, I'll be reading from verses 16 to 22. I suppose I ought to take a moment and get there as well. Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for your word. Lord, we ask that you bless it to us as it is read. And Father, we also know that some parts of the Bible are more clear than others. Some parts are more difficult to understand. Lord, just in the nature of how you work with each one of us individually, some parts of the Bible uh, in their clarity seem so very plain and, and obvious to some of us, whereas for others of us we get caught up on certain details and struggle. But Father, wherever this text intersects with each of our lives in terms of its clarity and its plainness to us, Lord, we pray that you might speak to us. Give us eyes that see and ears that hear. Bless this reading of the Bible to us, and Lord, in the preaching that follows, and as much as it is faithful to what you say, Lord, help it to be useful to each one of us and memorable as well. We pray these blessings in Christ's name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Ecclesiastes chapter 3, beginning with verse 16. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked. For there is a time for every matter and for every work. I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath. And man has no advantage over the beasts for all is vanity. All go to one place. All are from the dust. And to dust all return. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth? So I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? This ends the reading of God's word. Well, I'll tell you about something that happened yesterday. Yesterday, a couple of young men that I had mentored and are now off at college had red letter days. Saturday morning was a red letter day for them. They lit it up on the lacrosse field. Their brothers at Sonoma State, I always pronounce that wrong, I might have got it right that time. One is a goalie, one is an attackman, and they got the two great awards for that day in a big rivalry game that they won by one goal. The goalie and the attackman got the game ball and the team or, which is a funny thing that they do at Sonoma. In any event, they were higher than kites. So I called them up as their goal coaches often did and said, guys, I just want to tell you, I'm so proud of you, you did great, but I can't be long on the phone because my sermon isn't written yet. <laughs> and they said, Bobby, that's what the lacrosse players call me. We're so disappointed in you. And I said, listen, guys, you haven't read the last verses of Ecclesiastes 3. Don't judge. <laughs> I want you to think about this text for a minute. What does it mean? that the spirit of man is no different from that as a beast. How is it that the Bible can say, who knows whether the spirit of man goes up? How do we as Bible-believing Christians make sense of a text like this? How do we know that we aren't just like animals who die, get put in the ground, and that's the end of it? Because doesn't the Bible appear to say that here? Well, when we look at this text, we have to remember that Ecclesiastes is a lot like the book of Job. If you remember the book of Job, the book of Job alternates between orthodox statements that are true and heterodox or heretical. Heterodox means sort of not exactly right, but not exactly pagan, and flat out her heretical thoughts being kind of mixed up. And in order to understand any part of Job, you have to understand all of it and connect it all together and recognize that 
there's point and counterpoint. It's like you're sitting in in the book of Job on a great debate between truth and not quite truth. And so as you're looking as a child of God at the not quite truth, you have to compare it to the truth part and dig a little deeper. Well, Ecclesiastes is almost the same way as that. But instead of being a dialogue between one righteous man and three good but misguided friends, it is rather a dialogue between one man and himself. Weighing the pros and cons, the pluses and minuses of a worldview in which there is God seated on his throne and a worldview in which there is no God and everything is up for grabs. So Ecclesiastes, every section of Ecclesiastes needs to be considered as whether it is just a description of what the writer calls life under the sun, S-U-N, a brutal, short, mean, hard existence in which there's nothing new and everything is meaningless and vain and a chasing after wind and then you die. And then there's this, there is nothing better than living as someone who receives all that they have from God. Now, how do we square this particular text with that bigger conception of Ecclesiastes? First, I want you to notice that this is very much connected to what has come before in Ecclesiastes 3. Ecclesiastes 3 has told us, look, there is a time for everything under heaven. And he goes through that wonderful poem, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to build up, a time to tear down, a time to gather, a time to scatter, a time to tear apart, and a time to sow. And that God has made everything beautiful or right in its time. But we don't understand exactly what's God doing, because God has set in our hearts this idea of how it should be. We confess mentally that God has made everything right in its time, but we don't understand what God has been doing from beginning to end. We don't know what the bigger picture implies or how it is that a death was beautiful at this point or a tearing apart was beautiful at this point. We don't see the whole picture and so we struggle. And that's the burden of life in the first part of Ecclesiastes 3. The life of faith struggles with conceding the truth that God is sovereign and there is a right time for everything and yet here we are struggling and suffering. We don't see the whole picture. Now, the passage of Scripture that I read this morning is explicitly connected to that. Look at verse 7. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. He's going right back to what he said in the earlier, earlier part. So given that this is connected to what has proceeded in Ecclesiastes 3, I want you to think as a historian. What are two things that you need to know about anything in order to fit it into your paradigm of how it is that humanity is progressing through time? You need to know when and you need to know where. Those are the two brute facts that you need to know. And the first section of Ecclesiastes 3 talks about when. There is a time for this. This is beautiful in its time. That's beautiful in its time. This has to do with where, and rather than going through a long list of examples like the poem at the beginning, it picks one idea, it cuts straight to the chase. It says, where there should be justice, there is wickedness. Where there should be righteousness, even there is wickedness. Wickedness reigns where justice ought to prevail. The point is doubly made and powerfully. Now, in looking at this whole text, I want to follow a very simple plan proposed by an Old Testament scholar, Michael Eden. I would hate for you to think I'm that clever to come up with this stuff on my own. <laughs> Everything I say to you is pretty much learned from books and from reading the Bible carefully, but nothing original, and that's by design. So I want to share with you four, four key sections of this text. There's, it begins with an observation, and then there are two... Uh, comments and it ends with a conclusion. So let's start with the observation. Uh, the observation says, Moreover, I saw under the sun. Right? So he sees something. And then we have two comments. Look at what he says in verse 17. I said in my heart, God will judge. And then look at verse 18. 
I said in my heart with regard to the children of man. So here, let's back up here. He sees something. The writer of Ecclesiastes sees something. And then he comments on what God is up to. And then he comments on the children of men. And then he has a conclusion. Verse 22. So I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work. For that is his lot. Mm -hmm. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? So let's read just the beginning and the end together and leave the comments out for a moment. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice even there was wickedness, and in the place of righteousness even there was wickedness. So I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. What can bring him to say, see what will be after him? So if you start with the observation and you jump to the conclusion, you, you, you ask this very interesting question. What is it that makes the writer of Ecclesiastes recommend to us that in light of the pervasive, ubiquitous, everywhere present wickedness, even where justice should prevail, even in the court systems, what is it that causes the teacher of God's people, the writer of Ecclesiastes, to say, live your life and enjoy it, for this is your lot? <laughs> what in the world, what in the world could be powerful enough to make you say, well, you know what? As they say in New England, I'm not going to get my knickers over a twist just because there's injustice in every court of the land. How do you go from recognizing that this world is a broken cesspool of iniquity to thinking, well, I'm going to live well and be happy? Wouldn't it be wonderful if you knew the answer to that? And wouldn't it be amazing if by God's grace you could apply it? That's why we have Ecclesiastes. So that we can have a world and life view, a biblical perspective on existence that has its foundations in eternity past and its object in eternity future. And I want you to think very carefully about the comments that the wise writer of Ecclesiastes offers. His first comment is about God. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. No matter what happens on this side of heaven, there is going to be that great day, the great day of assizes, as the old Puritans said it, that great day when we all stand before the throne of God, when there is a final judgment. We kid ourselves and are so very childish when we talk about a Supreme Court. Let me tell you something, dear friends. There is nothing supreme about what goes on in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Not even a little bit. And this is, I would confess, one of the greatest nations this world has ever seen. There is a Supreme Court. And it doesn't have a panel of justices who argue and bicker and quarrel about minutia. The Supreme Court has one judge, Amen. and his name is Jesus Christ. And he will judge with righteousness. And that day is coming. And we as God's people, whenever we suffer through all kinds of indignities or duresses or see all kinds of unjust impositions thrust upon others who are being, being held down or kicked about and beaten and, and just treated horribly, whenever we see that, as powerless as we may feel, as oppressed as we may feel, as disregarded and despised as we may be, we know that at the end of the game, we win. Are, is anybody here a New England Patriots fan? Mm. No. I thought there's always, there's always one. No? Well, if you were, think about how hard it was to watch the Super Bowl with the Atlanta Falcons. And they're getting whooped by 28 points, and it's the fourth quarter. And you're sick to your stomach. 
and then they come back and they win. Now, think about how fun it is to watch the replay of that game, <laughs> since you know how it ended. It's a whole different experience, isn't it? Yep. When you know exactly what's going to happen, and you can't wait to see Tom Brady throw that clutch fourth down completion. You know, Christians, we are invited by the grace of God to live our lives that way. We know how it ends. And we should be watching the unfolding of history from the perspective of knowing who wins. The living God wins. And Christ, the Son of God, reigns. And He will judge. And every wrong will be righted. And every right will be exalted. And so we can look at the turnovers, at the fumbles, at the interceptions at the touchdown scored against us, at all of the grit and the grime and the frustration, and not be undone. We know that God will ultimately prevail, and He will judge all. And so we live well. That's what the writer of Ecclesiastes says about God. That God is not in the least bit frustrated or put out by the fact that people act wickedly. He will himself be victorious and conquer. But now what does he say about people? And this is where this text gets so fascinating and so difficult. I'm going to read this whole comment and we're going to unpack it. I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath and man has no advantage over the beasts for all is vanity. All go to one place. All are from the dust and to the dust all return. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth. Wow, what an observation. Let's start with the premise. I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them. Those of you who are Bible scholars know that testing has to do with the idea of proving, demonstrating. He is testing, he is demonstrating to them that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. God is allowing people to behave in a beastly manner so that they may see that they in and of themselves are animals. You see what he's saying? This wise writer of Ecclesiastes after he's lived his own life of wicked dissipation and failure and frustration, and at the end of his life when he returns to sanity and recognizes the supremacy of God, he says, I recognize this, that God allows unrighteousness to prevail, wickedness to prevail where justice should be, to prove to men that in and of themselves men are animals. I want you to think about human history. I love history. It was my undergraduate degree. And I, I continue to read history. I love watching history documentaries. How many documentaries make you go, Yay, humanity is so awesome! People are the best! Usually documentaries are about wars. Or about true crimes. I mean, you look at, and yes, there are instances of heroism of nobility of character in the midst of great trial. But the overwhelming picture, go home and look, I don't, whatever your choice of news agency is, whether it's CNN or Fox or MSNBC, whatever it is, okay, for right now, for these purposes, don't care. You go home today, you open up the page and you look at world events. How many of them are gonna be good news? How many of them are gonna make you say, Oh, people. How many of them are going to recount acts of cruelty and crime and horror? And I mean horror. Some of the things over the last year that I've seen in the news about parents killing their own kids and 
uh, you know, nations just bombing other cities the way we were doing in World War II. It's like we haven't learned a thing. It's really discouraging. <coughs> and have you ever thought that God is in a sense saying, you're going to live your life in utter denial and rejection of God? So I'm going to let you see exactly what that looks like. Left to yourselves, humanity proves to be beastly. It stuns me as a historian that socialism is making a comeback. And I beg your forgiveness if you're a neo-socialist here, but I'm going to be blunt. Socialism in the Soviet Union and in China under Mao deliberately determined to exclude any concept of God. Socialism as a godless system of human government killed more people, their own citizens, than every war history knows of. Upwards of 70 million people were killed in the 20th century by their own governments, and that's just counting the Soviet Union and China. Throwing Cambodia under Pol Pot, which arguably wasn't true socialism, and then you have more. If you are going to throw God out of your life, what can you expect? Satan loves an empty house. And Satan came to steal and to kill and to destroy. And that is exactly, according to John chapter 6 through 10, what happens to a world in which the living God is rejected. When the evidence of his common grace gets suppressed, and when we go herring off just as quick as we can to be our own gods and masters, we can anticipate disaster to unfold. And the proof will be that we, without God, are beasts. From John Calvin to C.S. Lewis, the observation is that apart from the work of God, we are mere purple-clad apes, brutal to the bone. And it's hard to deny that. It's hard to deny that. So God is allowing this grand demonstration of the depravity of man by saying, you want to deny me? You want to put wickedness where justice belongs? This is what it looks like. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. Now, what does that mean? Again, this is the same, observ same, same comment. He's commented about God, now he's commenting about man. Man who has decided to live themselves apart from God. Man who has decided that they are going to live the life of the beast. That they're going to be the masters of their own destiny, however animal that becomes. And from their perspective, there is nothing to distinguish them from a chimpanzee. Or a dolphin. Or a dung beetle. Or an ant because they have rejected the image of God in them. From their perspective, they cannot conceivably know and have no reason to expect that their eternity is any different than the goldfish that uh, you flush down the toilet after it's lived out its eight months. In fact, they might bewail the fact that they're not even going to live as long as your average tortoise or parrot. They are mere animals. To dust they will return, they'll be put in the ground, and they can have no conceivable way of thinking anything at all will happen to them. Their life is vanity. Apart from God, vanity prevails. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beasts is the same. Verse 19, so die as one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beasts, for all is vanity. And who knows? You know, what human being knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth? Again, no reference to heaven and hell per se, but just a different destination. If you live your life apart from God, you can have no conceivable confidence in any outcome in eternity at all. Because you're no different than that tortoise or parrot or dung beetle or porpoise or dolphin. Or chimpanzee. You're just a purple clad ape. You might look nice, 
but pure and utter corruption within. The two comments that this wise writer of Ecclesiastes offers in light of injustice are that God is going to win and he will one day judge. And that the great purpose of injustice is that God is letting us see exactly what results and exactly how hopeless is the human experiment of life without God. And in light of these comments, the writer of Ecclesiastes turns his attention back to the matter of injustice in the courts. So, I saw there's nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will come after him? A pregnant question. Only God can. And it is only by faith that we see what comes after us. And we as the children of God are able to see that indeed, when we see injustice, we need to know two things. One, God wins. Mm -hmm. And one day, all of these wrongs will be called to account as the end of verse 15 suggests what we looked at last week. The second thing we have to realize is that to give our hearts and minds and our fears and frustrations over to that godless paradigm in which we are so utterly invested in the here and now is to give up any grounds for having a distinct hope. Any grounds. You take God out of life and might makes right is the end of the day. You take God out of the equation and whatever makes you happy personally can be the only valid motive. And we are called to live differently than that. It's interesting to me that we are called not to just be stoic or to be smug. By stoic, I mean we're not called to say, oh well, all we have to do is endure. All we have to do is endure because one day God's going to get the bad guys. To be smug is to be like, yeah, you're going to get yours, buddy. <laughs> uh, we're to rejoice. What if the great antidote the great response to the wickedness we see in the front page and in the B section and in the back page of your newspapers and in every hyperlink in your web media, what if the great response to that is people like you and me genuinely being happy in Jesus and rejoicing in whatever things God has given us to be busy with, <laughs> loving our families. That's a big theme in Ecclesiastes. Loving our work, a big theme in Ecclesiastes. Loving our food, that's a big theme in my life. I mean, in Ecclesiastes. <laughs> I also love my family and my work, but anyway. Felt like I was getting a little heavy on you. But this is, what if that's the antidote? One of them, a big part of it. Offering your life as a witness that all of the temporary garbage that happens in this world ultimately does not win, and it will not ruin my day. I'm going to live my life confident in the work of Christ, hopeful that God is coming, knowing that wrongs will be righted, and boldly being whatever God has called me to be and do right now. What a different world that is if Christians everywhere started to act like that. You know, I often think that we, especially the evangelical Christians, and, and I'm de I definitely count myself an evangelical Christian of the old-fashioned variety, think Jonathan Edwards. It's easy for us to respond to injustice and horror in the world by getting angry. Mm -hmm. And there is a place for that. You may be sure there's a place for righteous indignation. But I think we undercut the significance of being happy and rejoicing. It's, it's, an, it's a fascinating thing. Utterly fascinating thing. There have been times when I, as a lacrosse coach, we've we've lost a game. We got clobbered. And guys on the team are like, Coach, what are you so happy about? And I'm able to say, you know, guys, we played well. We played well. We demonstrated a lot of character out there. 
and helping them, just the, the model of happiness against the cultural world which says winning is all that matters. The happiness that we can demonstrate for true and right grounds for happiness can be a catching thing. And it can lend itself to even institutional progress. Happiness. Rejoice in your work. Rejoice in who God has made you. Rejoice in who God has made us. Rejoice in the work He's given you. Rejoice. Not because the context is easy or the judges are fair, but because God wins and you are His. It really is that simple. And isn't it something how the writer of Ecclesiastes, this wise King Solomon and the great uh, rhetorical and wisdom tradition he passed on to whoever ultimately wrote this in his name. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing that he had to, the wisest man of his day had to waste an entire life to learn this? And we get to read it at the age of 54. That's how old I am. You get to hear it at the age of whatever you are. Some of you probably learned this decades ago. But what a thought to be reminded of this, to live well now. And to let a joy in the Lord be a contagious inducement to what? To the world saying, I want to know a reason for the hope that you have. Because Fox, MSNBC, CNN, they don't offer a reason for hope. But this does. And for any of you who are here today and you're wondering if you're different from the animals, you are. You were created in the image of God, utterly distinct and unique from all of them. You alone were created with a capacity for knowledge, righteousness, and holiness that suits you for conversations with the Almighty. You alone. And you alone not animals, not angels, have the unbelievable opportunity of repenting of sins and putting your faith in Christ, the Son of God, who died, not for animals, not for angels, but for children of men. You alone have the offer of life set before you and are invited to turn away from all of the injustice and the wickedness of this world and say, I'm going to put my hope in the living God. And every time a gospel minister stands behind a platform or a pulpit like this, it is our solemn obligation to say to you, choose life. Follow the living God. Don't be so addicted to this world and its power structures that you despair at wickedness. Rather, see what God is demonstrating about humanity. Come to your senses and flee to Christ and rejoice in the life He gives you and the eternity that is guaranteed. We do that by praying. Please join me. Almighty God, forgive us for our sins. We are, in and of ourselves, by nature, purple-clad beasts. We are like Asaph in Psalm 73 who says he was a brute beast before you when he railed against injustice. But Lord, you have made us and designed us and call us to be so much more. We are designed to pray to you, to be comforted by you, to have fellowship with you, to be at peace with you. Lord, to share in your work, to be delegated tasks of enormous and eternal significance. So Lord, we ask forgiveness for our sins and we freely and joyfully claim Christ as Savior. Help us to live for you. You will be our God. We will be your people. And we will rejoice in the life you've given us. Bless us, Lord. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.